You know, as I was sitting here watching the movie, I was thinking a little bit about growing up myself here on the south side of Chicago, and in particular, looking at the pot that was served at the tailgater with the men at the football game. My mother used to make that pot minus the corn. And it was, oh yes, <laughs> I'm looking at the expression on her face. Oh yes, she, yes she did, mm-hmm. And it had pig ears, pig feet, pig tails, and neck bones in it, okay, chopped up with onions and hot peppers and all of those things. And whenever the holidays came up, my great aunts would always call to say, is Doris making pot? They wouldn't say what it is, it was just called the pot. <laughs> what time, never mind, I'm coming, I'll be there. And so between that and cornbread and all of the things that went along with it, it was something that it was that was a tradition in our family. The thing of it is, and I think that it really speaks to this in terms of the movie, she did it one time a year. Anybody who wanted to share in it, and I think that it also speaks a lot to the history of eating these types of foods, and it doesn't matter, frankly, if you've come from an African-American background, a Latino background, there are certain things that we connect to culturally that make us feel good and warmed and welcome and really reflect a lot of our history. Um, but as I said, it was done once a year. We don't spend 3,000 or 3,500 calories anymore in our lives going out, cooking in the fields, those types of things. And so food as memory and a connection to our culture and tradition is something that I think is really quite something. Um, I've got someone that I would like to bring up to the front right now because I think we're going to get started with our cooking demonstration. And so the next thing that we have on our agenda is Chef Betty Jo Nichols, who is going to come up and talk with us a little bit about making healthier foods along with our young people who are going to be involved in our cooking demonstration. So Chef Nichols, why don't you come on up to the front? And we'll have some of your students to come up as well. And, before, and also, I'm going to have you to introduce the students, too. OK? Hi, I'm Betty Nichols. I'm the executive director of uh, Homemaking Skills Institute. I am happy to be here. And thank you, Dr. Miller. It, uh, I'm a consultant for UHI. I am the type of person that will sit and listen. And we were having our consultant meeting. And then during the meeting, they were trying to find a chef for this event. And of course, I just listened. And you know, I wanted them to pick the right person for the event. And Dr. Miller says, well, we have uh, on our line part of our consultant is Betty Nichols, and I was at an event, and <laughs> so here I am. So today I would like to introduce to you the students from Perspective Middle School. They will be helping me in a demonstration of a chicken pot pie. So the first thing that Ms. Nichols is doing is that she's making sure that her student chefs are getting all situated in terms of having on gloves because we want to do this in a way that the food is healthy and we you know, keep down on, on bacteria and other things. And so she's getting them all set up for that. How many of you had a mother or a grandmother or a family member who made homemade chicken pot pie? Oh, y'all were lucky. That's wonderful. So you know how good and satisfying and fulfilling chicken pot pie could be. It's almost like having chicken and dumplings, but with a little bit more of a pie crust on it. And so being able to make this in a healthy fashion um, is absolutely wonderful. So uh, Chef Nichols, you're handing some of your student chefs some ingredients there. Can you tell me what um, they've got in their hands? Uh, young man with the black, blue, uh, black jeans on, what have you got there? Uh, I have garlic. OK, so you've got a little bit of garlic there in the bag. OK. Okay, minced garlic, okay, and uh, young lady, you look like you've got something in the bag there with the red headband, what's in your hand? I have onions. Okay, so we've got minced onions there, okay. Young lady here in the middle, what's in your bag? Um, chopped celery. Chopped celery, so we've got onions, garlic, and celery so far, okay. Uh, young man with the box in his hand, what is that? Chicken broth. Okay, what does that chicken broth box say on it? fit and active chicken broth. Why is that important? A lot of times when we think about sauces and broths and soups, they can oftentimes be very heavy. And what two things that can sometimes make the dish not so healthy? Salt, Salt exactly, right. Salt, and what's the other thing? Fat, okay, very good. So when we have something, and you can get these at the grocery store, 
that at, and she got this at Aldi's, okay? This is not something that came from Whole Foods or Dominic's or Jewel, but this is something that she got from Aldi's, that you can get healthy, low salt, low fat foods, and you can work this out to make something that is very healthy, okay? And young man on the end, what do you have there? Okay, so cream of mushroom soup. So when you think about, am I gonna go in and sit down and make a cream sauce from scratch in order to put in there? You can have a very healthy cream of mushroom soup that's there that can serve as the base of your uh, chicken pot pie. Okay, so Chef Nichols, you wanna continue? Yes. So we're gonna make our chicken pot pie by using the broth to boil our chicken in. And we're just putting the chicken that's already been cooked, that's been boiled in the chicken stock from the raw chicken. We put the raw chicken after we season it up in our chicken broth, okay, in a pot. Okay. And then we add our seasoning vegetables, which are our onions. <laughs> Sorry. Yep our minced garlic, and our celery. So once we have the seasoning vegetables with our chicken and our stock, we just wanna stir, stir it up, let it come to a boil so that the onions and all of that can cook. Now, because we're on a speed process, we're gonna add the next items that we're adding to our dish would be that chicken, the, uh, the, cream, of the cream of mushroom soup. We're, we're adding flavor. That's what we're doing. That's why we don't use water. We're adding all flavor. And your recipe requires that you will add mixed vegetables. Now, you at Aldi's, they sell a bag of frozen mixed vegetables. We use the frozen items as opposed to the can. It's your choice. But I use the frozen because I kind of like to see the vegetables. I like to see each one. And that way you can add your favorite, a little bit more of it, if you like. And so we add our peas, we add our corn with carrots, our potato, and our green beans, okay? And we add that right to the mixture. Okay, once this all boils, it just, you know, you put a top on it, and I think in your recipe it says 20 minutes. Once it comes to a boil, the, the vegetables will become a date, which they're soft enough to start putting them in our pie shell. I bought this at Aldi, it's already, made, all you have to do is spray your pan, spread it out, put it in, you know, okay? Once your vegetables are completely, you know, where they're soft enough, you can put them in the pan, put the top layer on top, and once you put it in the oven at 400 and bake it, all you're gonna wait for then is for it to rise, the browning of the crust. Okay, and that's your pie pie. We have prepared the pie pie in advance so that you can get a sample and taste what it tastes like and you know, and they will start dipping it up, passing it out as I'm preparing to talk to you a little bit about foods that can change your mood, okay? You know, one of the things that I think is really important about what uh, Ms. Nichols just did in the demonstration is that it doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to sit down and make all the pie crust yourself. You don't have to worry about, um, you can have fresh vegetables when they're available, but they're also very good and very healthy substitutes that you can get at other times of the year. The other thing that I think is important about this and the reason why we wanted to do this on nutrition and to have our young people involved in doing this is that young people can do this. Young people can, can cook and can make a contribution. Um, when I was growing up at about age 11 or so, um, and the, the way that the lady said in the um, tape, it was my responsibility to make one meal for the family per week. And so Friday night was my night and I could pick whatever I wanted to. My mother and I would go ahead and do the shopping for it, but I was able to take that on. And so, you know, we've got middle school students here that are 11, 12, 13 years old. It's something that they can get involved in and also when kids become involved in cooking they learn more about nutrition they learn more about their taste their likes their dislikes and they will be more likely to eat something that's very healthy in the same way that uh, here as opposed to having flaming hots in a blue jug 
So for those of you who do, does everybody pretty much know what Flamin' Hots and a Blue Jug are? Okay, all righty. I, well, <laughs> I see a hand up there from a young man in the back. So they're, they're Cheetos that have um, the hot kind of red hot coating on it and then the, it's a blue jug sometimes people call it blue juice and so it's the little blue raspberry juices that sometimes people can get um it is not the breakfast of champions let's put it like that <laughs> because i as i looked at the program and it talked about uh how to love your heart as well as eating healthy i just wanted to make a little um statement about loving your heart as we are into the month of February where we celebrate or we talk about our heart and heart disease being the number one killer. I saw this little brochure and I just want to give a minute to say the five things and, or the five ways that we can love our heart. It has nothing to do with food that changes your mood, but I just thought that it was so appropriate that you know we kind of say a little bit about it. And the one thing as we watched the film, it talked about being active. It says that the American Heart Association recommends at least 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity every day. It also says the second thing is to eat smart. Enjoy a diet that's low in sodium. That's why we chose the pot pie, the chicken pot pie is very low in sodium. And uh, saturated fats and trans fats and rich in fruits and vegetables. Rich fiber, whole grains and modest saturated fat and polysaturated fat. And the third thing for a healthy heart is to elevate your risk your age, gender, your uh, ethnicity, your family history, and other medical conditions can all increase your risk, your risk of developing heart disease. Know which factors affect you and what you can do to reduce them. The fourth thing is to listen to your heart. When warning signs pop up, Pay attention to them by visiting a doctor early. Your chances of avoiding a serious condition will not increase. And the fifth thing and the last thing is to know the facts. Read up on heart diseases by knowing about the culprit. You will be better prepared to help prevent and fight it. So I, my assignment today is to talk about foods that change your mood. And mood foods are foods that we eat that have an effect on how we feel every day. One of the major factors in mood foods is the brain chemical called serotonin. And high levels of serotonin keep a person calm and relaxed, while low levels cause the body to crave carbohydrates. Unhappy feelings are often caused by low levels of serotonin. Good foods that contain high levels of serotonin are fish, chicken, and turkey. Bananas and avocados are high fiber cereals and whole grain products can also boost the mood. Unfortunately, many bad mood foods also taste good. Foods that are high in sugar, they can negatively affect your mood, although they will give an initial instant lift. Around an hour later, a drop in mood and energy will follow. A sugar rush can lead to mood swings, including anxiety, lethargic, and, anxiety, and um, irritability. Foods that can cause a bad mood also include those that with lots of additives, preservatives, and food coloring. Studies have shown that certain nutrients in food can positively affect moods. Indeed, some nutrients influence the function of specific neutral transmitters in your brain. Food influences neutral transmitters by attaching to brain cells and changing the way they behave. Depending on which foods you eat, with, with, eat, you develop certain levels of neutral transmitters, which can certainly affect your mood. Believe it or not, it is possible to beat the blues or an attack of the grumpies by watching what you eat. If you sometimes find yourself short-tempered or irritable, quick to snap at your friends or your family members or your coworkers, you may be in need of a better eating plan. 
One of the biggest contributors to either a sudden or a chronic low mood is a drop in your blood sugar glucose. So let's look at ways to maintain an even mood throughout the day. We can consistently throughout the day eat every four to five hours. It, provide, it provides your brain and your body with a constant source of fuel and it can prevent dips in your blood sugar levels. Now keep in mind that if you have already been diagnosed with diabetes, you may need to eat every two to three hours. We can limit refined carbohydrates such as our soda, candy, fruit, juices, jelly, and syrup, which can cause drops in our blood sugar. And it leaves us feeling grumpy and tired. If you stick to whole grain versions of these foods, you can digest them more slowly because of their higher fiber content and keep your blood sugar stable. So here's what you can do. You can combine high quality carbohydrates with lean protein. Provided com prov protein combined with high fiber carbohydrates like oats and barley and certain fruits and veggies have the ability to slow the absorption of sugar in the blood and lessen your mood swings. Suggestions for breakfast would be an egg white omelet loaded with veggies with a little salsa on top. For lunch, grilled chicken and peppers in a whole grain tortito. And for dinner, shrimp, broccoli, stir fry. For your snacks, you can do celery with peanut butter or non-fat yogurt or berries. So the problem is moves affect the way we look at the world that's around us. If we are constantly feeling blue or low or we're angry or our view of the world will continually to appear negative. Most of the time our mood swings back to center from the highs and lows and then we recover from our disappointments or our joys of victories. Occasionally our moods go haywire and they stick at either end of the spectrum. We may be suffering from clinical depression and generally be considered out of balance. Most of this has to do with the foods we eat on a daily basis. Another healthy suggestion is to eat foods that are rich in omega-3 fatty acids and folic acid. Omega-3 fatty acids are present in the brain at higher levels than any other part of the body. A particular interest is the ability of omega-3 fats to help alleviate depression. Omega-3 fats can be found in fatty fish like wild salmon, sardine, or mackerel and to a lesser extent in ground flex seeds, walnut, and omega-3 fortified eggs. Folic acid also seems to be important in regulating your mood. However, if you are experiencing the blues on a regular basis, you should consult your doctor. But if it's just temporary mood swings, try to include leafy greens for breakfast. Sunflower seeds, soybeans, beets, oranges, and all of these are rich in folic acid. So we have prepared a very colorful dish, a chicken pot pie, that we hope that you would enjoy. And maybe you can try it. The recipe is right in the middle of your uh, program. And it will definitely help in controlling your blood levels. Chef Nichols, thank you so much. And also, thank you so much to the students from Perspectives Middle School for both being our demonstration chefs and also um, distributing the food. You had a question, ma'am? Yes. Uh, we noticed the lesson wasn't in the recipe. We wanted to go and get the case of Okay, so the question is that the mushroom soup is not in the recipe that's printed in our programs. Is that one can of cream of mushroom soup? It's one can of cream of mushroom soup, and also the margarine is in Okay, so the margarine is in there and that was taken. On the fat. 
Cutting down on the fats, too. Okay, so thank you so much. I think at this point, as we're having our students to come off the stage, we're going to have our panelists to come up, please. So Dr. Levi, Chef David. Hello, everyone. How are you? Um, my name is Dr. Cornetta Levi. You can call me Corey. Everybody does. I am your local Walgreens pharmacist, and I know everyone is kind of shocked, like, oh, my God, you're a doctor and you're a pharmacist? Yes, <laughs> we are doctors. <laughs> um, the thing that I would like to be the take-home piece of this is, one, I'm glad an event like this actually is occurring because I would prefer people to be more proactive in their health before you come to me, <laughs> you know? And the thing is, the reason why I say that is because when you get to me, it's a little bit too late on certain things. We can start getting you back in, in the groove of things, getting your blood pressure back in tune, but I'll prefer that we get you on track now before you have to come to me. So, and the thing is too, everything is in moderation because Lord knows I love my heroes. I do. <laughs> but I, I, I make sure I force myself to only partake in that once a month. And I have my happy Sunday, you know, me and the dog on the couch and we loving it. But and any other time I'm doing my P90X, you know, you have to be proactive and you have to move. And I, one thing I do tell my patient, they're like, well, I walk up and down the stairs at work every day. If it's something that you do every day, it is not exercise. If you're walk, I walk, I walk from the bus stop to my house. That is not exercise. Your body gets used to that you have to do something different walk a different direction see something different that is not what we consider exercise 30 minutes vigorous exercise my thing is in the summertime I love my garden get in the garden if you can get to grow your own vegetables I, that is my woosa moment with my flowers and my my herbs especially my herbs if I especially can get the the rodents out of it and all the raccoons and stuff around my house but at any rate y'all you understand me oh my god man and I'm like I got a possum like where's a possum man I'm living in this inner city where's the possums coming from <laughs> but at any rate I'm sorry I digress but <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. If you can start, like, I live in a condo building, and I have, we have our own little community garden. I basically do the gardening. They take part on the festivities after it's all done. But it's still, even with my busy work schedule, I'm telling you, if you can get in your garden, just get some seeds from your local um, Home Depot, or they have the plants already started out from you. It's the best thing to grow your own fruit and vegetables. I love it. And, um, and that is one thing I can say. If you're starting to learn how to cook, cooking with herbs, cooking your own stuff, it is, you, you get everybody to come over. Okay, Here, I'm sorry. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the biographies for all of our speakers are in the program that you have this evening, and they'll talk a little bit about their backgrounds, but they all have very distinguished backgrounds, and all are very concerned about loving your heart and loving your health, and that's the reason why we're here today. I've got Ms. Tonya Roberson, who's one of my colleagues at the University of Chicago, that's going to speak to you a little bit about nutrition, and also her interest in doing this work, and particularly keeping African American women healthy. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tanya Robertson, and I'm a nutritionist at the University of Chicago, and I'm currently working on a much-needed project called Improving Diabetes Care and Outcomes on the South Side of Chicago. And I think it's very important to promote healthy and um, good nutrition because good nutrition reduces your risk for many chronic diseases. It um, eliminates obesity. And it'll just help you live a longer and healthy life. It's very important for you to eat at least five to eight servings of fruits and vegetables each day. That will actually save your life. And you could implement fruits and vegetables. That sounds like a lot of fruits and vegetables a day, but you can implement them in like an omelet, like the chef mentioned earlier. You can add any of your favorite vegetables inside of an um, egg to make an omelet. Omelet. You can have a salad with each meal. You can add vegetables to tacos or spaghetti or whatever you may like. And it's also important to make sure you exercise because it's not just good nutrition alone. It's nutrition and physical activity. Thank you so much. <clears throat> good evening, everyone. My name is Chef David Fuller. I am a 
culinary arts instructor of uh, culinary arts and hospitality at Chicago Vocational Career Academy, and also I'm a uh, founder of Eating to Live LLC, which we specialize in after school programming for healthy eating and also home economics uh, for our young people. And I, I really can identify with soul food junkies because uh, two weeks ago I tried to show it to the high school students. And that was a little bit difficult because of you know, their attention spans and competing with their iPhones and iPads and things of that nature, but to really try to explain to them about health and nutrition. One of the things that I can also identify with, with Byron is uh, his uh, coming into the knowledge of when he read Eating to Live uh, by Elijah Muhammad, and that happened to me when I was in college with the Florida A&M in Tallahassee, Florida, and I can identify there was a soul food restaurant called Ma Mary's, and it was like a five-minute walk f from campus, and when we were freshmen, that was like whenever we would get a care package of some money, we could go treat ourselves to a Ma Mary's meal. It was like $10, and my favorite was the Smothered Pork Chop Dinner, and this smothered pork chop dinner was so flame. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was just unbelievable because you get two big pork chops and a big mound of rice and gravy and then two additional vegetables plus a corn muffin and all you can drink sweet tea. And so my roommates and I would just go there and we would Instead of a five walk, five minute walk back to campus, it would take us 20 minutes, and everybody would go back to our dorm rooms and take a nap. <laughs> so, from uh, reading Eating to Live, that was how in college we all changed our eating habits, and during our sophomore years, we stopped eating pork, and we actually went home and. Everybody was like, you don't eat pork anymore. So I can identify how that makes a change. Now, transitioning now to 2013, and I've been um, teaching culinary arts and hospitality for the past uh, 10 years in CPS, and also doing uh, healthy cooking camps and classes. The most important thing that we try to get over to the young people is that the diabetes and the, the heart disease is we don't pass down these diseases, we pass down poor eating habits. And part of what we try to do in the classroom is introduce them to healthier ways to prepare the food that they're most familiar with. But where we come into, I guess, that education, and that deals with our restaurant deserts and food deserts, and how the Walgreens Healthy Eating Initiative, and also what they're doing with all these, is to be able to show the young people familiar recipes and unfamiliar recipes and vegetable ID. So we will go into a, a vegetable ID class where we will show them how to actually saute spinach. We will show them how to steam broccoli, show them how to, and also eat broccoli without cheese sauce, because they need to know how to do that. Show them what cauliflower tastes like, Brussels sprouts. We make salads with 12 different vegetables on them. Now, the kids will actually fight me because well, in order to get your grade, you have to make this particular salad. Well, I don't eat that. Well, if you don't eat that, they would just rather have nothing. Or we'll have a healthy stir fry with lots of vegetables, and the kids will end up with just meat and sauce and rice. So part of this is not I don't like it, it's never been introduced to me before. So that we take this opportunity in school and after school programming to actually introduce new foods to the students and also n new cooking methods. Uh, we have students that have never had chicken that was not fried because it's not being done in the home. We have too much processed food in the home. But I guess the joy and satisf satisfaction that I get is, especially with the young people, that they like food that is prepared, more healthy, and then they also go home. And this is where we're able to impact families and communities because they take their recipes and they also want to be involved in the grocery shopping process. And they say, hey, mom, dad, I can actually make this. And I think over time that, that education part, we're going to make a big difference moving forward. Great, thank you. That's wonderful. Um, and if I remember correctly, uh, Chef Fuller, didn't the team at Chicago Vocational Career Academy receive an award for their healthy cooking through the Healthy Schools campaign? Is that right? 
guess last year we uh, we went to Washington D.C. because we were the Chicago winners. Actually, it was our second time winning the Healthy Schools campaign. <laughs> And we went to Washington, D.C. in last May, actually twice. The first time we went to testify for a, con a congressional hearing on antibiotic food in schools. And the recipe, ironically, that we used, we had, we won with an oven fried chicken. Uh, we had a sweet potato salad. And also we had a mixed greens uh, with collard greens and cabbage, and we call them cousins. And so that was very important of introducing to, I guess, the school communities that the kids can actually have a different, this is familiar food, but this is a lot better than the standard chicken patty that is served that everybody reaches for the chicken patty. This is familiar food to them, but it's prepared in a healthier way. So we look forward to doing more work and uh, with the community and the kids. Thanks so much, Chef Fuller. Um, I, what I would like to do now is that I'm going to open up the floor for questions, but I also want to remind you that a number of you have had some evaluations that have been passed around by Mrs. Watson on your tables. Please make sure that you fill them out. And in particular, for our young people that are in the audience, there is a special question on the back of this for you. We organized this event in order to look at health and nutrition issues and helping to not only love the heart hearts and souls of our, the older members of our audience, but in particular bringing in young people. And we want to hear from you about, about what you think in terms of being available in order to help us to plan programs like this in the future. And so we're very interested in your thoughts and opinions, and we want to figure out ways in which we can bring more of these kinds of programs to the community and making sure that it focuses on the kinds of things that you're interested in. So with that, I am going to open up the floor for questions. And if you could stand up, ask your question, and then I'll repeat it so that other people in the audience can hear it so you can direct questions to any of our panelists, um, or if you'd like to have a comment or a question about the movie that you just saw a little while ago. So, questions or comments from people in the audience? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I want to say that um, I am familiar with the film because I really love the movie because I have a brother right now who have diabetes and he refused to change his eating habits. But I myself have changed my eating habits because diabetes and all these things are in my family. I don't like so food anymore. I mean, I eat the healthy way, and I feel 100% better. But when I eat, through, if I have to eat something wrong, I can tell it right away. I just have this down, mm -hmm. and I know I've ate something wrong. So that's a wonderful testimonial in terms of thinking about, you can think about food as medicine, and I think that that's something that uh, Dr. Levi was referring to, in that if you think about, and also Ms. Nichols, when she was doing her demonstration, all of the different colors of the vegetables that were in um, the, the chicken pot pie, thinking about eating a rainbow, and that if you're able to eat that rainbow of fruits and vegetables, that you can actually um, have a much healthier meal. Oftentimes, people think that they can't do, be, do without meat, but I have to tell you, um, I had my daughter to taste some of the dishes from Seoul Vegetarian Restaurant, in particular, the barbecue tips that are supposed to be like rib tips, and I asked her what she thought of it, and she said, this is good, I'll eat this. And I said, do you want me to tell you what it's made of? And she said, no, 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 don't do that. Because if you tell me what it's made of, I will not want to taste it. And so if someone offers you a nicely seasoned dish that happens to be either a vegetarian dish, which will have some animal protein in it sometimes, whether it be through milk or egg, or a vegan dish, which is all vegetable based, try it to see if you like it. Just don't, as, as Chef Fuller was saying, just do not reject it because you think that it looks funny or, or you've never had anything like that before because you just may find that you really like it. So thank you so much for that testimonial. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, Dr. Miller. Uh, I have two questions to ask. Uh, one of the students here uh, who are participating, as I understand, for the first time in this program in their school, I wonder if they have any life-changing stories since they've been involved in the program. And then second, to uh, Mr. Fuller, if he could talk about any similar aspects that his students have seen as far as life changes 
because of the uh, mills are being used on uh, third and <laughs> Who has a testimony? Uh, <laughs> Lumella? Come on up here. <laughs> you served us so nicely a little while ago when you were huffing off the nipples with the pot pie. So you, can you share something? Uh, this is your second semester in the program. Uh, we have some new students that just joined this semester, but Lumilla has been with us since the beginning of the school year. Can you share something arbitrarily, what your experience has been as far as healthy eating or what you've gained for the first part of the program? Um, I learned that you should never judge a food by what others say or by its cover. <laughs> that was short and sweet. Lumilla, you get, you're not getting off that easy. So let, let me expand upon the question a little bit more. So it's great that you're in the school, you have all these tools and resources available to you, but as soon as you hit the school doors, the front doors, you go back home or out, you know, as soon as you leave the school, you're confronted with flaming hots and little jugs and you know, whatever else. How has what you learned in school helped you to be better, more healthier even outside of school? And that's to, uh, uh, um, um, what do you like to snack on? What do you like to snack on? Usually, even before I met Kame Arts, um, it was carrots oh, okay. Okay. and milk. Carrots and milk? <laughs> All right, sometimes around this age in particular, it's really hard to get young people to drink milk. They think about it, that's something that babies have. Also, sometimes people develop a little bit of stomach sensitivity to it, so they may be less likely to drink it. So having a young lady like this to say that she's making those kinds of choices is well, it's a little bit different because I have a feeling that this age group is a little bit easier to impact than the high school students because they're so set and rigid and the wrong eating. I mean, I it took me a while to actually get to explain to the students when they come and well now they stop at the at the front door where they get all the flaming hots and junk bags they don't let the in but of course with anything they can still be smuggled in and so a part of my nutrition course that I go through with the young people is to explain to them the demographics of of, of, of Frito-Lay and the, and the chip manufacturers and how when I was growing up in the 70s at the corner stores in our neighborhood how they used to have a bottle of hot sauce by the cash register and that translated because the the big food companies they studied that and so the salesmen took that back to feedback to the manufacturers because they're like man everything is a hot sauce henceforth that's where flaming hots come from so from studying urban communities they have different flavor profiles and so and also I explained to the young people that they put additives into the uh, flaming hot chip bag to make you want more and you notice that the small price point is very affordable at 25 cents that's not by accident that's to make like everybody has 25 cents so because of the addiction of the of the chemicals that they put into the flaming hots everybody's at least going to get four bags <laughs> i mean the minimum and you never see a student without more than one bag so that that's number one behind the education what they're so addicted to and that goes with the little huggy juices and the honey buns and everything that you see in our gas stations and local corner stores and the end caps that are from a retail perspective I know Walgreens you see our impulse buy so uh, consumers you see it is right there because you're going to grab it right there at the register you don't have to go to look for it and the second part going back to actually what they're eating in the homes because of the way that um, our families are we've got parents that are working third shift first shift second shift um, we're eating outside the home and even working class families the saddest thing that we see around five six seven o'clock is 
a mother or a father taking two or three kids in on a Wednesday night and they're just going to Wendy's and that's like the quick fix solution. And okay, we know that we have fast food for a treat, but when this is becoming two, three, four nights a week and we're not getting a healthy cooked fresh food, you know, there's a reason why we can sell on a value meal a hamburger for 99 cents. Well, we explain to the, to, to the young people that that's not necessarily real beef, it's a derivative of beef, of course, McDonald's is able to sell that cheaper than anybody else, but it's not real beef. And anything that is cheap is not really good for you. So in order, but in order to make the changes, you have to know. So, and I tell the students that ignorance is, is sometimes given a bad connotation, but it's not necessarily a bad word. It just means that you don't know. And you know, the eating to live uh, movement that you know that I live by and try to inspire to young people so they can take back to their families is just education. And I think that we'll be able to have an impact over education. Wonderful. Have a question for Dr. Levi. Have you started to see any changes? at Walgreens in terms of what kinds of things people are purchasing now that you're introducing more healthy selections into your stores? Um, when we started doing the desert, the food desert stores, the first one that I actually worked at was on 111th in Michigan. And when we did the research to figure out when, when we wanted to have one there, was it profitable to have one there, we did the math. It was 28 blocks to get to the jewels that was on Halstead that now has moved farther away now because it's on, what's that, Marshfield Plaza. And then to get to the the jewels that was on 87 was 47 blocks away. And people in that area take the bus. Not, not a lot of people have cars. So it, to get to the nearest fresh produce store would take them on the bus 45 minutes to an hour. So we looked at all those areas that had that. And when we start introducing those fresh marts, if you've ever been into one, and everyone loves to go to the Walgreens on 75th and State, that's like the corner store. It is literally a mini grocery store. You have your fresh fruits and vegetables. You even have a meat aisle, the freezer part that you're actually getting real pork chops. I was surprised. I went in, I was like, is that a pork chop? I mean, it was like, I was like, okay, who's at doing Walgreens. the buying? At Walgreens. But that's the thing. It's in the community that you can go and walk to because that's the biggest impact. If you don't know what a fresh vegetable looks like, if you don't know what a real Roman tomato looks like, if you don't know how it touches, how to feel, how do you know that's something that you're supposed to eat? People are used to getting their vegetables in the can. I remember going to, you know, Aldi's with the, the Libby labels and stuff like that, and then you couldn't, they, the cans, they just had the word on it. That's what we knew. We didn't know that the best substitute, if you can't get fresh vegetables, to get the frozen. And then now we're, now people are like, no, I want something fresh, it needs to crack. I think that's been the biggest impact, and people can come in and they shop, mm -hmm. and then they can use their wick and whatever. But they actually come in there and shop and smell, and then trust me, and they fuss if the this orange is not ripe. It doesn't smell like the orange last week. They come in, and I'm glad that they're doing that because I'm glad that they had that opportunity. Because before they were going to the, the little corner stores, and it was basically junk. It was not healthy to eat. You know, very important point, and I know that one of the things about Walgreens in particular is that they try to have Walgreens within a half a mile of wherever you live. So if you think about going to the Jewel 28 blocks away, 119th Street down at Marshfield, Marshfield Plaza, and for people either not having cars or having to drag things home on, um, on the bus, not being able to get grocery delivery, all of those things are very important. I'm going to talk about grocery stores for just a moment because one of the things that Ms. Roberson has worked on through her diabetes project is that she actually takes people on tours of grocery stores and works with them on being able to make healthy choices in their food. Talk to me a little bit about that. Um, with our diabetes project, we have a partnership with Save a Lot Grocery Store. And with this partnership, um, this year we're going to have a grocery store tour every Saturday. And at this grocery store tour, we take the participants around the perimeters of the store because we feel that in order to eat right, you have to know how to shop right. So we take them around the perimeters of the store to show them how to shop healthy and to shop on a budget. And we teach them how to read food labels. How many of you read your food labels? 
okay? And what's the first thing you look at? <laughs> Sodium, salt, sugar, all of those are good things to look for, but the first thing you should look for is servings per size. For per, uh, servings per container, I'm sorry. Because if you're a diabetic and you're watching your carbohydrates, if you have an item and it's like the servings per size is 2.5 and you eat the whole container, that'll be two and a half times the amount that's actually listed on your food um, fact label. And also read your ingredients. The ingredients list is listed in descending order going from the largest amount to the smallest amount. So if something says this is low sugar but high fructose syrup is your second ingredient, that means it is high in sugar. And if it's something on there that you can't pronounce, we recommend that you don't eat it. Right, that's right. Okay. <laughs> you can't pronounce it, don't eat it. <laughs> That was great, thank you. So if you can't pronounce it, you don't recognize it, don't eat it. Frozen is a good substitute if you cannot get fresh, and I think that's something that Chef Betty just demonstrated to us in terms of being able to make healthy foods and being able to make them year round. I think that we've got about five more minutes before we're gonna be closing up for the evening. Would like to take a couple of other questions from the audience if you have them. Any more testimonials about people who have made life changes that have really changed their health and the way that they feel about themselves by making changes in their diet? Yes, oh, actually we've got someone in the back. Please, ma'am, stand up. I didn't know I was sitting by the nutritionist from there, but I knew over in Florida, I asked her, I said, I'm vegetarian, she said, I am, I keep my diet because I don't want That's a wonderful testimonial and Thank you so much for sharing that in, in terms of being able to go to a plant-based diet and actually reversing diabetes. Oftentimes when I see patients in my office and they're just diagnosed with diabetes and I know that it's related to their weight and how they eat, they have a small window of opportunity to do as you've done and to make these kinds of changes in their diets and their lives. And they may decide that perhaps becoming a vegan and having an all plant-based diet doesn't necessarily work for them, but they can even continue to have types of animal protein included in their diet, increasing their exercise, and doing all of those things to get off the medication. And trust me, if you do that, you're not going to put Dr. Levi out of business. Don't worry about it, because <laughs> she, as a, as a trained pharmacist, she's there about supporting health. I think that sometimes some of the saddest things that you can see when you're a health professional is knowing that you have a patient that you have cared for, that you've serviced over the years, and seeing them having lots of complications as a result of things that they may not think that are in their control, but they actually are. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean, I, when you were saying that, I think people really don't understand that because recently one of my technicians, and when I say young people don't get it, it's what happens to them. This is, this is a young lady who's less than 30 who just had a full on on blonde stroke. She cannot, she is blind, she cannot walk, and she cannot talk, and she's 30. Uh, she never took care of herself. She was a diabetic, non-compliant, never took her meds, thought that she, because she was small, she buck 50, I'm skinny, I'm healthy, I don't care about my diabetes, that's just something I can deal with, and never took care of herself, had high blood pressure, cholesterol issues. Now she's in a rehab facility and will be there for the rest of her life. People, you, even when you're 15, you, you really need to take care of yourself. And then the thing is, I know that when you're young, you think you're invincible. I know I used to be like that too. But stop and really think. When, some, when a health professional tells you something about yourself, you take, don't take it with a grain of salt. Take it with the whole table. You need to be proactive and get something done because that, is, that has hurt my heart 
more than once just thinking about her, going to visit her, because she is totally preventable. She could have did what she needed to do. I worked with her for two years, fussing at her, please go take your meds. Please, I'm, you work in a pharmacy, I can, you can get your meds. And then, and then she just wouldn't take it. And now it's just, it's just sad. Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. One thing we thought we needed to add in at the very end is about portion control. Because even if you're eating the right things, you have to pay attention to your portions. If you ate a piece of steak every day, it would be fine. But if you eat a whole round steak, you're gonna be overweight. If, if you um, really want to get control of your health, you need to look at the portion. So a portion of rice is a cup of rice. So if you have got three or four cups of rice on your plate full of butter, you're gonna have a problem, even though it is plant-based. The same thing with um, your other items. So you really do have to look at the amount of food you're eating as well as what it is. Thank you so much for bringing up the point of portion control because, again, as Ms. Roberson was saying, if it's a little bit is fine, but look at the size and how many portions are in a container and making sure that it's that. You've got a diagram of a plate in your programs, and it's a new way in which we're thinking about how to fill your plate with food. It's a rainbow diagram that's there in terms of filling it up halfway with vegetables. One portion of it should be your starch or your carbohydrate, and the type of portions size that our, um, our audience member just mentioned. And then if you're going to have a protein with it, the other quarter should be that. But having more vegetables on that plate is important. The lady that's got on the green sweater in the back there, I think she's going to be our last comment. Yes, miss, please stand up. much. I think that those are very important comments and wonderful reflection on Byron Hurt's wonderful movie. I have a colleague in the audience who is a pediatrician. She's a doctor who takes care of children, Dr. Joy Elion. And I have a question for her, if she doesn't mind. Dr. Elion, would you stand up, please? Thank you. Dr. Joy Elion is a doctor at the Friend Family Health Center. She's very interested in health and nutrition, and this is one of the areas that she studies as well as taking care of patients. Dr. Elion, how many times does it take in order to introduce a new food to a child before they d develop a taste for it? Well, over at least 10 times, sometimes even 15, before you actually decide whether or not you like it. Um, so you can so say, oh, I tried it once, so I'm like it. You got to give it to them over and over. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Elliott. So for those people who were thinking, I tried once, I tried twice, they didn't like it, just set it aside. If you don't succeed at first, keep on trying, keep on trying. Eventually, the children will develop a taste for it. I'm going to give all of our guests one last opportunity to make a comment, and then we'll let you go ahead and enjoy the rest of your Valentine's Day with your loved ones. I just wanted to say, I forgot to say, one of the most important things through our, all these eating habits is learned behavior. So we're introducing it to our young people. They're going to get it. So please do it. And also, uh, community health alert is I'm anti-buffet. So these buffets, old country buffet, going to the riverboat, it's your worst enemy. It's not made for you to eat healthy. You've got all of this food and all these choices, and you, your, your stomach, it, you overeat. So it is made that you go to overeat. So when you, I hope that uh, the next time you go to a buffet or somebody says you go to a buffet, start feeling kind of guilty. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> And I like to add to remember to eat in variety and moderation and too much of anything is not good for you. And to savor the flavor of your food and when you eat, just pay attention to what you're eating. Don't watch TV because it takes 20 minutes for your brain to signal your stomach that you're full. And if you eat real fast and go back for about two or three servings, you would have overeat, eaten by the time the 20 minutes has come. Okay. Thank you. My last thoughts is thank you for letting me be a part of this. I, I think people really need to see that their pharmacists, not just behind the counter, but we're actually out in the community. We're actually out doing things like this, and we are a wealth of knowledge. So please feel free to call on us at any time. And just thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm loving this. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Can we have another hand for our wonderful guest today? Great panel, great discussion, and also thanking Chef Betty Jo Nichols for the wonderful pot pie that she was able to provide for you. She has lots more here with foil to cover it up, so if you want to take some home, just come on up front to the desk, and she will have something there for you so that, as we often love, say, can you make a little something, something, a little plate to take home? We've got plates to take home for people, so please come up and enjoy yourselves. Um, stay tuned for those of you who came to Community Grand Rounds tonight. We will be doing another one um, at the end of March. And Ms. Watson, are there any other announcements or things that we need to cover for this evening? Make sure that you give Ms. Watson the evaluation. She's the lady in the black jacket and red dress over here. Put your hand up, please. Want to make sure that we get those because those are very important in helping to shape the programs that we do in the future. Thanks again for coming and happy Valentine's Day.